الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا قبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الحبيب المرسلين محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان لا يوم الدين ما بعد قال سبحانه وتعالى إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد قال سبحانه وتعالى إن الدين عند الله الإسلام وقال سبحانه وتعالى ومن يبتغي غير الإسلام دينا فلن يقبل منه Respected علماء My respected elders, my brothers and my little ones Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh after praising the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending salutations on Nabiya Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I begin by thanking you, the people of Blackburn, for inviting me to convey the message of Allah and His Messenger Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu wa sallam alayhi. I pray to the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah accepts these efforts of yours in listening to this message as I pray to the Almighty Allah that Allah accept my efforts in delivering this message. All evening guys, you've been talking about the main course. But there's one thing that you forget. Some places, the starters are so good that you just don't need the main course. And my Ustaz, Azad Mulan Abdurrahim Sahib's words were such Really, you don't need the main course. Nevertheless, Karen Armstrong was a Roman Catholic nun. She's written many works. One of the works that she's written is called Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A Western attempt to understand Islam. This is what she writes in her introduction. But one major religion seems to be outside the circle of goodwill. And in the West at least, to have returned its negative image. People who are beginning to find inspiration in Zen or Taoism are usually not nearly so eager to look kindly upon Islam. Even though it is the third religion of Abraham and more in tune with our Judo-Christian Judo tradition. In the West, we have a long history of hostility towards Islam that seems as entrenched as our anti-Semitism, which in recent years has seen a disturbing revival in Europe. At least however many people have developed a healthy fear of this ancient prejudice since the Nazi Holocaust. But the old hatred of Islam continues to flourish on both sides of the Atlantic. And people have few scruples about attacking this religion, even if they know little about it. In the chapter Muhammad the Enemy, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she writes, now it seems that the Cold War against the Soviet Union is about to be replaced by a Cold War against Islam. I ask you how true these words seem to be. Never mind on both sides of the Atlantic. Every corner of the globe, the grip against the Muslims is getting tighter. A 
And the world, in spite of its vastness, is becoming tight upon the Muslims. Somebody is making a mockery of the Prophet of Islam. Somebody is having a go at the Book of Islam. The Muslims are labeled fanatics, fundamentalists, terrorists. The teachings of Islam are belittled. Every aspect of Islam is demonized. Demonized by people who have no knowledge of Islam whatsoever. I ask you, my brothers of Blackburn, tell me, is this Islam? Is Islam as it is being described in the media today, is Islam as it is being portrayed in the Western world? Tell me. Yes or no? But you're bound to say that. One may argue that you're bound to say that. Why? Because you're Muslims. You're bound to say that Islam is a beautiful religion. It means peace. It invites towards good. Tell me, who else holds this viewpoint and opinion other than Muslims? What will you say to me? You're saying to me Islam is good. I'm saying you're biased because you're a Muslim. You're bound to say it. Tell me who says Islam is good other than a Muslim. And exactly as I anticipated, silence will prevail. We have no answer. This is why I decided to look at Islam for today's session from a non-Muslim perspective. Why? Because those of us who are Muslim and whose Iman is being tested at this moment in time, and who are in doubt because of this negative propaganda against Islam. When they hear what is about to be delivered, they will thank the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon them. And for those, my non-Muslim brothers, the benefit for them will be that they will get a true insight of Islam by those that they consider their own non-Muslims. In recent times, what is the biggest discovery in the West? Democracy. Everywhere in the world, the cries of democracy. Let us establish democracy. This is the biggest discovery and the Western world wanna give this gift to every country in the world and especially the Muslim countries. And today, all you will hear me is you'll hear me reading, quoting. I can deliver this by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from my head. But I will read. Why will I read? So that nobody accuses me of being biased towards my religion because I'm a Muslim, alhamdulillah. Or, nobody accuses me of misinterpretation. That the person said something, and this guy's gone and interpreted it in his own words to mean something else. I will read, you will listen, and you will decide for yourselves. They talk about democracy. Sarojini Naidu, an Indian poetess, a non-Muslim, this is what she writes. She writes, it was the first religion that preached and practiced democracy. For in the mosque, 
When the minaret is sounded and the worshippers are gathered together, the democracy of Islam is embodied five times a day. When the peasant and king kneel side by side and proclaim, God alone is great. She further writes, I have been struck over again by this indivisible unity of Islam that makes a man instinctively a brother when you meet Egyptian, an Algerian, an Indian, and a Turk in London. What matters is that Egypt is the motherland of one and India is the motherland of another. Reverend Bosworth Smith, he writes, talking about Islam, it is the religion which merges all colors, ranks and races in the consciousness of one brotherhood. They talk about the democracy of Islam. Never mind democracy, adding to this, I would say, Islam was the religion that gave humans their basic rights. Today in the Western world, the Western world may seem to be seem to appear as the well wishes of the human race. They may claim that they were the first people to give human their basic rights. Yet in reality, the truth, the initial striving for the establishment of basic human rights in the West and especially in England did not begin before the 11th century. The most important document with regards to human rights, the Magna Carta, as you are aware or should be aware, was signed 12th June 1215. Few hundred years before this, the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the farewell hajj, he stood up and in his khutbah, he explained the basic human rights. 1400 years ago, and to truly value what Islam offers, let us look at the human rights. Never mind all the human rights, let us just look at one aspect. The aspect of equality and justice. And we will only value what Islam offers when we look at what was offered at the dawn of Islam when Islam came to this world. In the Arab world, society was divided into two. You had the worthy and you had the worthless. You have the noble and you have those, the common people. The Quraysh, they believed that they were superior. Nobody could equal them. They believed because they were the sons of Ibrahim alayhi salam, custodians of the Holy Kaaba, residents of Makkah al Makarrama. Because of this, nobody was equal to them. And if we look at history, in the days of Hajj, when everybody, every other person would make his way to Arafat, the Quraysh would not proceed to Arafat. Because they were superior, they would stay in Muzdalifah. This was justice. That if a nobleman kill, was killed, then in retaliation, they would kill that person that was equal to that nobleman. So for example, let us say a slave killed a nobleman. In retaliation, they would not kill the slave. They would either kill the master, or they would look in the slave's relatives for that person that equals the nobleman, and in retaliation, they would kill this person. This was Arabia. Greek. Professor Arthur Kirsten writes, this was the situation, he writes, the nobility of Persian dignitaries was measured by their ancestry and their states. Between the noble and rich and the common man, unsurmountable walls had been erected. The former had been preferred above the latter in all aspects, mounts, dress, 
dwellings, orchards, women, and servants. No difference. When the emperors, just listen to the titles the emperors would give to themselves. The emperor Koros, when he wrote to Justinian, this is how he addressed him. This is the, these are the titles that he gave himself. Divine presence, the beneficent, giver of peace to the lands, deserving reverence, Koro, king of kings, most honorable, holy, bountiful to whom the gods gave dignity in abundance, and equal to the gods, the most excellent of excellent. The second Persian emperor, when he wrote a letter, he went a step further. All these titles, and after this he writes, an imperishable human among the gods, and a god unrivaled amongst the humans. This was Persia. Quickly move on to Byzantium. I'm sure you've heard of Justinian. He died five years before Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born. And this was his concept of equality. And he challenged mankind, okay, let us see anyone who can bring out a law better than this. He divided mankind into three categories. You had the honestios. This was the upper class. The death sentence could not be given to these people under any circumstance. Secondly, you had the humilios. Again, death sentence could not be given to these people un except under extreme circumstances. And then you have the servi. These people you could kill for any reason whatsoever. They were burnt alive. Lions were let loose on them. This was their concept of equality. I'm sure you've heard the name of Aristotle. Aristotle writes in his work as Siyasa, the Republic. This is his concept of equality. He writes, The law is not equally applicable, applicable for all citizens. Only people of equal descendants, rank and status are equal before the law. The law is not applicable to the rulers since the rulers are the law. Subjecting superiors to the law would be ridiculous. He further writes, It is against the principles of justice to kill a nobleman in exchange for a commoner or to exile him, thus forcing him to live in a strange land among a strange people. Again, no concept of justice, no concept of equality. Hinduism. In the Manu Shastra, this is what is written. A religious and authentic scripture of the Hindus. This is what is written. The omnipotent creator has made the Brahmin from his mouth, the Shatri from his hands, the Desh from his thighs, and the Shudra from his feet, so that they may populate the world. Hinduism runs on a caste system. The Brahmin, the highest, and you have the Shudra, the lowest. Listen to the different laws with regards to the Brahmi and the Shudra, and these are taken out from their works. First, with regards to the Brahmi, it says, A Raja must not put a Brahmi to death regardless what crime the latter might have committed. A Raja, even if on the brink of death due to poverty and starvation, must not let any Brahmi remain hungry. A Brahmin must not be killed irrespective of any crime committed by him. Rather, he is to be exiled from the land along with all of his belongings. Instead of inflicting capital punishment on a Brahmin, just his head is to be shaved. Members of any other caste, however, can be put to death without any restrictions. If a Brahmin stands in the need of it, he may seize the belongings of a Shudra forcefully this is not to be considered as an offense. A Brahmin is to be considered truthful under all circumstances. If he appears as a witness, it is enough for him to say, I speak the truth. 
and he will not have to swear an oath like others. Now look at the laws with regards to the Shudra. If a Shudra recites the Vida, this is one of the holy books, then his tongue is to be cut. If he hears it recited by others, then molten lead is to be poured in his ears. If Shudra learns the Vida by heart, then he is to be torn apart. For a Shudra, it is strictly forbidden to learn the Vida. If he does so, then he and his teacher will be born as demons in the next life. Serving the Brahmin is the only act of worship prescribed for a Shudra. His salvation depends only on this. If he happens to do any other good deed besides this, then he will not get any credit for it. A Shudra's duty consists of serving members of the three upper castes. This is the sole purpose of his existence. A Shudra must not accumulate wealth, even if the authorities permit him to do so, because if he becomes wealthy, it might be a source of grief for the Brahmin. If a Shudra happens to touch the food of a Brahmin, the latter must not eat from the food under any circumstance. If a Brahmin drinks the water of a Shudra, then it becomes incumbent on him to drink for three days water heated with a special herb to become pure again. If a Shudra takes a Brahmin or a Shatri's name in disrespect or abuses a Brahmin, then it is the Raja's duty to punish the Shudra by thrusting a red hot iron nail into his throat. If a Shudra spits at a Brahmin, then his lips are to be cut. If he raises his hand, hands against a Brahmin, then his hands are to be cut. And if he kicks a Brahmin, then his feet are to be cut. If he sits at the same level as a Brahmin, then his buttocks are to be branded with a rock, red hot iron. Even if the Shudra is freed, he will be never considered as free because the omnipotent creator has destined him to be a slave. He is a slave right from the day of his birth. This was Hinduism. Come to the Western world at the dawn of Islam. There was no concept of justice and equality in Europe when Islam came. The Europeans considered themselves to be superior. Why? Because of their white color. And everyone else, because of their black color, was considered to be inferior. And this is how they justified slavery in Africa. They believed, because the Africans are black in color, they have no culture, they are illiterate, they are uncivilized. Because of these reasons, it is okay to make them as slaves and use them as slaves. And we see in history, that from 1811 to 1870, 109 million black Africans were driven out from their homes. Can you imagine? 109 million people, they made and turned into slaves in this short period. In the 18th century, an African who ran away from his master from the USA, this is what he had to say with regards to the laws. The law gives the master unlimited authority over the slave. He can give him any kind of work. And sometimes he can even kill him. Without exception, a slave in spite of being human doesn't have any rights. He's like a personal property, like a dog or a horse. In the book of his master, his name appears alongside horses, sheep, sheep and pigs. As per the law, he cannot have a wife, child, house, any possession. He cannot own or keep anything. The English historian Franz Crony 
describing the situation of slavery in England in 1687, this is what he writes. He writes, this is the greatest market of imported slaves. They are coming here stark naked. Any potential buyer is opening mouths and inspecting them like horses or any other animal. A woman in Virginia was convicted and tried. Tried and convicted. Why? Because she taught a slave girl how to read. This was the sentence of the court. This is what it read. An infinitely embarrassing crime. Society has never been disgraced so much. A slave girl reading the Bible, no enlightened society can continue to exist as long as this breaking of the law is not punished. And when slavery finally ended in the Western world, it took a different form. It exists to this very day. That form is called racial discrimination. I mean, South Africa, America, just recently, 40, 50 years ago, what was the condition? Blacks and whites separate. Blacks were not allowed to attend school, and if they were, they had separate black schools. In the buses, a certain section was allocated for the blacks, certain section allocated for the whites, because the blacks are inferior, the whites are superior. They were not allowed to attend their functions, their gatherings. They were not allowed to intermingle. Racial discrimination in the Western world, I mean, it exists everywhere, but it still exists to this very day in the civilized countries. This is what the world had to offer at the dawn of Islam. Now, let us look at what Islam offers. 1400 years ago, the Prophet Islam in the farewell heads, this is what the Prophet said with regards to equality. Ayyuhan nas, Rabbukum wahid, O people, black, white, red, yellow, green, blue, irrespective of your color, your Lord is one. Black, Allah is the same. If you're white, then Allah is the same. If you are green or yellow, then Allah is the same. Your father is one. Your origin is one. You all came from Hazrat Adam alayhi salam. And Hazrat Adam alayhi salatu wa salam was created from the earth. Ya ayyuhan nas, inna khalaknaakum min dhakarin wa untha wa ja'alnaakum shu'uban wa qaba'il. Why did we make you into different tribes? Why? Later arafu. So you recognize one another. Ask for the criteria for superiority. Inna akramakum inda Allahi atqaakum. The more God-fearing you are, the more close you will be to the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ صُوَرِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ يَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ وَعَمَالِكُمْ If you are black or white or red or green, it doesn't make a difference. You will only become close to the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when you begin to fear the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No black guy has any superiority over a white guy. No white guy has a superiority over a black guy. No Arab has any superiority over a non-Arab, and a non-Arab has no superiority over an Arab. This is what the Prophet of Islam declared 1400 years ago. And the Prophet of Islam not only declared this, the Muslims and Islam practically demonstrated this. Professor Ramakrishna Rao, again, I can use my own words, but listen to the non-Muslims. And look at, look at the beautiful words that they've used for this. Professor Ramakrishna Rao, he writes, 
every year during the pilgrimage season, the world witnesses the wonderful spectacle of this international exhibition of Islam in leveling all distinctions of race, color, and rank. Not only the Europeans, the Africans, the Persians, the Indians, the Chinese all meet together in Mecca as members of one defined family, but they are all clad in one dress. Every person into simple pieces of white seamless cloth. One piece around the loin and the other piece over the shoulders, bareheaded, without pomp or ceremony, repeating, O oh Allah, here I am, at thy command, thou art one, and the only one, O oh Allah, here I am. Thus there remains nothing to differentiate the high from the low, and every pilgrim carries home the impression of the international significance of Islam. Ramakrishna Rao giving another example of what Islam has to offer. And see if you can bear this in mind. And then I will read out his words. Mecca has been conquered. Hundreds and thousands of people are there. Muslims and non-Muslims alike. The Quraysh are there. The Banu Hashim are there. The likes of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, the son in law of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The holy Kaaba is there, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 70,000 angels go around this house making tawaf. And they will keep on doing so right till the day of judgment. And when one angel does this, he does not get a turn right till the day of judgment. Thousands of people are there. Who does the Prophet of Islam call to give Adhan in the presence of the likes of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali? In the presence of these thousands of people, Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from amongst the crowd calls Bilal Habshi, the Ethiopian radiallahu ta'ala an, to come and he comes and he climbs the holy Kaaba and he gives the Adhan. This is what he, and listen to the words that he uses. Consider the state of Bilal, a Negro slave in the days of the Prophet of Islam, nearly 14 centuries ago. The office of calling Muslims to prayer was considered to be a position of honor in the early days of Islam. And it was offered to this Negro slave. After the conquest of Mecca, the Prophet ordered him to call for prayer. And this Negro slave with his black color and his thick lips, stood of the roof of the holy Kaaba, the most historic and the holiest places in the Islamic world. He further writes, the prophet of Islam thus brought about such a mighty transformation that the noblest and purest among Arabs by birth offered their daughters in marriage to this Negro slave. And whenever the second Khalif of Islam, known to history as Umar the Great, the commander of the faithful, saw this Negro slave, Umar Farooq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he immediately stood in reverence and welcomed him by exclaiming, here comes our master, here comes our Lord. Can you imagine Umar Farooq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Amir al-Mu'mineen, half the world was under his feet. And every time Sayyidina Bilal al-Habshi radiallahu ta'ala anhu would come, Sayyidina Umar Farooq radiallahu ta'ala anhu would stand and say, here comes our master, here comes our Lord. This is the reason as to why in the Western world, black Africans are reverting to Islam. Because Islam is the only religion that gives them equality. Everywhere in the world, they look down upon inferior. Islam is the only religion that gives them dignity and that gives them honor. And I don't say this. Reverend Bosworth Smith writes, he writes, Christian travelers with every wish to think otherwise. Christian travelers with every wish to think otherwise have remarked that the Negro who accepts Mohammedanism acquires at once a sense of dignity of human nature not commonly found even amongst those who have been brought to accept Christianity. How 
How beautiful are the words of Mahatma Gandhi? This is what Mahatma Gandhi said. For I have seen that any Zulu embracing Christianity does not ipso facto come on a level with the Christians. Whilst immediately he embraces Islam, he drinks from the same cup and eats from the same dish as the Muslim. This is what they dread. This is the equality that Islam gave. For justice, I can give you hundreds of examples. But again, virtue is in the witness of one who doesn't believe. Just one example. What did Bashir ibn Sa'ad say to Sayyidina Umar Farooq radiallahu ta'ala an? When Sayyidina Umar Farooq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, on one occasion he asked his people to see how much power he has upon them. Yeah, how will you deal with Umar Farooq if Umar Farooq radiallahu ta'ala anhu does not rule with justice and equality? What did Bashir ibn Sa'ad say to Umar Farooq? The very Umar, can the shaitan will not walk in the same alleyway as Umar Farooq. The very Umar, can when his name was mentioned in the gatherings of Caesar and Khoro, they would begin to shiver and tremble. What did Bashir ibn Sa'd say to that Umar Farooq? He took out his sword and said, okay, Umar, if you do not rule with justice, then we will straighten you with this sword. And what did Umar reply? All oh, praise to the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has left people in, my, in, in the Ummah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that will never let Umar go astray. And this equality that I'm talking about and this justice that I'm talking about, did Islam just give this to the Muslims? Or was this equality and justice for everyone? Listen, and this document has been recorded by Richard Pocock, the Bishop of Meath. Listen to what Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam granted the monks of Mount Sinai and Christians in general. Listen to this. It reads, As God is great and governeth from whom all the prophets are come, for there remaineth no record of injustice against God. Through the gifts that are given unto men, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the son of Abdullah, the apostle of God and careful guardian of the whole world, has written the present instrument to all those that is national people and of his religion as a secure and positive promise to be accomplished to the Christian nation and relation of the Nazarene, whosoever they may be, whether be noble or the vulgar, the honorable or otherwise saying thus. Whosoever of my nation shall presume to break my promise and oath which is contained in this present agreement destroys the promise of God, acts contrary to the oath and will be a resister of the faith. For he becometh worthy of the cause, whether he be the king himself or a poor man or what person soever he may be. That whenever any of the monks in his troubles shall happen to settle on any mountain, hill or village, or in any other habitable place, or the sea or in desert, or in any convent, church or house of prayer, I shall be in the midst of them as the preserver and protector of them, their goods and effects with my soul, aid and protection. Join me with all my national people, because they are a part of my people and an honor to me. Moreover, I command all officers not to require any poll tax of them or any other tribute because they shall not be forced or compelled to do anything of this kind. None shall presume to change their judges or governors, but they shall remain in their office without being deposed. No one shall molest them when they are traveling on the road. Whatever churches they are possessed of, no one is to deprive them of them. Whosoever shall annul any of these my decrees, let him know positively that he annuls the ordinance of God. And it continues. And it even says, listen to this. And if Allah gives you the chance to read this document, it is worth reading and it is worth putting it in places where non-Muslims frequently visit. It also reads, if a Christian woman shall happen to marry a Muslim, the Muslim shall not cross the inclination of his wife to keep her from her chapel and prayers and the practice of her religion. 
that no person hinder them from repairing their from their churches. Whosoever acts contrary to this migrant or gives credit to anything contrary to it becomes truly an apostate from God and his divine apostle because this protection I have granted to them according to this promise. No one shall bear arms against them, but on the contrary, the Muslims shall wage war for them. And by this, I ordain that none of my nation shall presume to do or act contrary to this promise until the end of the world. I mean, I've not read the whole document. Allah give you the tawfiq to do so in your own time. But after listening to what the Prophet wasallam wrote for the monks of Sinai and Christians in general, I ask, still the accusation that Islam was spread by the sword? Still the accusation that Islam was spread by the sword after listening to this document, which even Richard Pork, the Bishop of Meath, has recorded? That Islam is a compulsive religion? What is the reality behind this? Listen to what Gibbon, and he was a, a famous historian. Listen to what Gibbon writes. He writes, A pernicious tenet has been imputed to the Muhammadans. The duty of exterminating all the religions by the sword. This charge of ignorance and bigotry is refuted by the Quran, by the history of the Muslim conquerors, and by their public and legal toleration of Christian worship. The greatest success of Muhammad life was affected by sheer moral force without the stroke of a sword. He further writes, but the millions of African and Asiatic converts who swelled the native ban of the faithful Arabs must have been alert rather than constrained to declare their belief in one God and the Apostle of God. By the repetition of a sentence or the loss of a foreskin, the subject or the slave, the captive or the criminal, arose in a moment the free and equal companion to the victory, victorious Muslims. Every sin was expiated. Every engagement was devolved. The vow of celibacy was superseded by the indulgence of nature. The active spirits who slept in the cloister were awakened by the trumpet of the Saracens. Saracen is a name given to the Muslims. And in the convulsion of the world, every member of a new society ascended to, to the natural level of his capacity and courage. And he writes some beautiful words. Listen to this. He writes, The first attack, or one of the first attacks of the Turks or the Saracens took place in the latter end of the 8th century. They came from the north betwixt the Caspian and Black Seas and were not then of the Muhammadan religion. But they soon afterwards came across to the religion of the conquered Saracens. He's talking yeah, that the Muslims were conquered. And the conquerors that came across, they embraced Islam. He explains, in this conversion of their conquerors, a most remarkable and pointed refutation is given to the often repeated charge that Islamism was indebted to the sword for its success. For he is a grand proof that Islamism not only converted those whom it conquered, but also those who conquered its adherents, it converted its conquerors. What he's saying in a nutshell is that Islam, not only did they convert the people that they conquered in the different countries that they went. When the Muslims were conquered by other people, they also converted those people that conquered them. Remarkable. Godfrey Higgins, and I'm going to cut it short now, writes, he writes, cutting, cutting it short, he writes, they persecuted nobody. Jews and Christians all lived happy amongst them. He further writes, in all the history of the Khalifs, there cannot be shown anything half so infamous as the Inquisition, nor a single instant of an individual burnt for his religious opinion. Nor do I believe put to death in a time of peace for simply not embracing the religion of Islam. He think in all the history of Khalifs, there is not a single time when the Muslims may have 
put somebody to death or kill him because they did not embrace Islam. So if that is the case, let me ask you, how did Islam spread? And why is it spreading today every corner of the globe? Hundreds and thousands of people are embracing Islam. The answer to this are in the words of Mahatma Gandhi. So beautiful words he writes. I pass from the companions to the Prophet himself. He's reading a book. When I close the second volume, I was sorry there was no more for, for me to read of that great life. I became more than ever convinced that it was not the sword that won a place for Islam in those days, in the scheme of life. It was the rigid simplicity, the utter self-effacement of the Prophet, the scrupulous regard for pledges, his intense devotion to his friends and followers, his intrepidity, his fearlessness, his absolute trust in God and his own mission. These are not the sword carried everything before them and surmounted every obstacle. Today, another allegation, and it's ironic. Hundreds of women are embracing Islam. Last point and I will conclude. Hundreds and thousands of women, Western women, are embracing Islam. Yet, the Western media, and th this is what's ironic, are claiming that this is a, a very oppressive religion. That Muslim males force their women to cover. Yet why is it that the Western women are turning to Islam more than the males? What is Islam offering the Western women that they are turning to Islam in their hundreds? To understand this very briefly, I'm sure that you are aware the value of, of a woman before Islam came. In the Arab world, they buried him alive. And again, I can quote all this, but I'm, to, to cut it short, I'm just going to give you the gist of things. In the Roman society, there were cases where they were ashamed to even take the name of a woman. Hinduism, Sati, she was cremated with her husband, burnt alive. She had no value. Look what Islam gave them. And this is what Western, non-Muslim, influential people in the Western world write. To what Islam gave women. The French historian Gustave Le Bon, he writes, Islam had a great and exceedingly beneficial impact on the life of a Muslim woman. Instead of humiliating them, Islam gave them honor and raise their position. Let them prosper like men in, more, in almost every field of life. The law of inheritance and women's rights which are stated in the Holy Quran are most beneficial, more comprehensive and closer to the nature of women than its European counterparts. The European historian Arthur Gilman writes, I'm just going to take a few words what he writes. He says, after studying the teachings of Islam, I can say with full conviction that Islam is offering men and women what is nearest to equal rights. Women are not just considered to be birth machines or devilish devices to destroy the souls of men. Islam teaches to treat women equal and with justice, not to marry them for the sake of laying hands on their wealth, not to harm them, to treat her relations well and to educate her. I know that they are barred from becoming scholars of Christianity, even if she has enough knowledge to become one. At most, she can become a maid in a church. Islam, on the other hand, has made the pursuit of religious knowledge binding on men and women. The door to distinguish, distinction, education and training is equally open for all. Islamic history is full of women who were scholars, doctors, poets and preachers. 
Karina Medimak, she writes, even today a married Muslim woman enjoys better legal protection than an English woman. Islam granted such rights to women which even French women do not have today. Last quotation. In the Encyclopedia of Religi Religion and Ethics, and I think it is because of this that Western women are reverting to Islam, it, 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 in there it is written, the women in common Muslim families were like queens in their houses, sharing happiness and sorrow with their husbands, and there they started to be treated with honor and respect. This is the very reason as to why Western women are reverting to Islam. Because in reality, for those that, the Muslims that practice Islam, their wives are queens in their palaces. That is the reality. Today, another accusation is this religion is very backward. It has nothing to offer. All the discoveries today have been made by the Western world. Again, is this the reality? Let us see what the Western scholars say very quickly. Godfrey Higgin writes, okay, Europeans are very vain of their present superiority over the Mohammedans in science, arts and arms. And to hear them talk, a person might be induced to suspect that in no former age had any nation ever risen to any eminence in these elegant and useful acquirements. But in this, he would be much deceived. And this is exactly the situation today. When you hear these people talk, it seems that these are the only people that have ever made discoveries. Nobody in no age has ever done anything or contributed to society that we live in. He says, but in this, he would be much deceived. Except perhaps in some branches of experimental philosophy and manufactures, there was no branch of art or science which was not almost in as great perfection amongst the subjects of Khalifs as they are now in Great Britain. I mean, there's so much here that I would love to share with you, but because of lack of time, I cannot. But if you just listen to Robert Briffold's words, he writes, the debt of our science to the Arabs does not consist in startling discoveries or revolutionary theories. Science owes a great deal more to the Arab culture. It owes its existence. Meaning, the science came from the Arabs. One guy goes even further and he writes, and his name was George Barton. He goes a step further and he writes, he is so influenced by the contribution of Muslims in the field, in the sciences, he writes, the main task of mankind was accomplished by the Muslims. Yani today all you're seeing is that the, the core and the foundation, all the hard work was done by the Muslims. And what you're seeing today is what people have just derived from the hard work of the Muslims. And he writes, the great philosopher Al-Farabi was a Muslim. The great mathematician Abu Kamil and Ibrahim ibn Sina were Muslims. The great geographer and encyclopedist Al-Masadi was a Muslim. The great historian Al-Tabri was still a Muslim. And I conclude with the words of, and if I can find them, somewhere here, of Mahatma Gandhi. He writes, Islam is not a false religion. Let Hindus study it reverently and they will love it even as I do. And I just change his words here and I will say, never mind Hindus, let everybody study it. Muslims and non-Muslims alike. And you will love it as I sure do. Dr. Julius writes, we may boldly say that God has not created mankind for Islam, but he revealed Islam to serve the moral and spiritual need of its believers. And the last quotation, and it's absolutely superb. In a nutshell, he summed what Islam is all about. And he gives an example. Canon Isaac Taylor, he writes, 
It is not the first propagation of Islam that has to be explained. But it is the permanency with which it returns its hold upon its converts. Okay, those people that revere to Islam, how it, how these people, I mean, what, how it grips these people that they stay as Muslims and they never re revert back or convert back to what they were. An African tribe once converted to Islam never reverts to paganism and never embraces Christianity. Look at the words. He's writing that an African tribe, when it reverts to Islam, it never goes back to paganism and it never goes back to Christianity. Why? When Mohammedanism is embraced by a Negro tribe, paganism, devil worship, fetishism, cannibalism, human sacrifice, infanticide, infanticide, witchcraft at once disappear. The natives begin to dress. Filth is replaced by cleanliness. Drunkenness becomes very rare. Gambling is forbidden. Immodest dancing and the promiscuous intercourse of the sexes cease. Hospitality becomes a religious duty. Female chastity is regarded as a virtue. Industry replace, replaces idleness. Law, order and sobriety prevail. Feelings of humanity, benevolence and brotherhood are inculcated. Polygamy and slavery are regulated. The evils restrained. Islam above all is the most powerful total abstinence association in the world. Whereas the extension of European trade, all this European trade that is extended, what does that mean? It means the extension of drunkenness. And we witness this today. The extension of drunkenness and vice and the degradation, degradation of the people. And this is exactly that what we are witnessing in the Western world. Drunkenness, vice, sin, morality is disappearing. Islam introduces a civilization, a civilization of no law order, including a knowledge of reading and writing, decent clothing, personal cleanliness, veracity and self-respect. Its restraining and civilizing effects are marvelous. How little have we to show for the vast sums of money? And, and listen to these words. How little have we to show for the vast sums of money and all the precious lives lavished upon Africa? Christian converts are reckoned by thousands. Muslim converts by millions. These are the stern facts we have to face. It is a pity to ignore them. We ought to begin by recognizing the fact that Islam is not an anti-Christian faith, but a half-Christian faith. How beautiful Canon Isaac Taylor has summarized what Islam has to offer. And how beautiful Islam is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, brothers, you and I, we were born Muslims. And today, we are being tested. Negative propaganda about Islam. And all of a sudden, one begins to question the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One begins to have doubts with regards to Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the teachings of Islam. You've heard how beautiful your deen is from those who do not even believe in your deen. You may say to me, guys, why do they revert? An individual doesn't have the power to guide people. You were the fortunate ones. You were the ones that he chose and he guided. Repay the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by doing this. Leave this world in such a state that the last words on your lips are the kalimah.